Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Peter Lawfer, an investigative journalist, broadcaster, and documentary filmmaker working in traditional and new media. Lawfer worked as a news correspondent for NBC News, reported for CBS and ABC Radio, and was the Berlin voice of the public radio program Marketplace. He has also produced and directed an award-winning documentary film on immigration in Europe. Lawfer is the author of several books dealing with critical social and political issues. His book, Mission Rejected, 2006, focuses on American soldiers who return from Iraq opposed to the war. In his book, Wetback Nation, also 2006, Lawfer argues for the free movement of Mexicans across the border. Lawfer is currently writing a natural history trilogy published by Lions Press. The first book, The Dangerous World of Butterflies, 2009, is an examination of the strange subculture of rare butterfly enthusiasts. As a follow-up, Lawfer wrote Forbidden Creatures, 2010, a study of the exotic pet industry. The third book, tentatively titled No Animals Were Harmed During the Writing of This Book, is due out in 2011. Lawfer was recently named the James Wallace Chair in Journalism at the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communication. He began his tenure at the U of O in the fall of 2010. Peter, welcome to UO Today. Well, it is terrific to be here. I can't believe it's taken us three months into your post here to get you on the, uh, the show with us, but I'm glad you're here now. Well, it's good that it took that long because I wouldn't have found the place prior to now. <laughs> I'm still learning what's where. Well, yeah, even after 15 years, it took me a while to find my way to the studio, so I, I appreciate that. But I do want to start with how we happen to have the good fortune that you were willing to come and join the faculty. And let me just preface that by saying you have done so many other things. Your career as a journalist has taken so many other forms. What would attract you at this point in your career to a named chair at a journalism and communications school? Well, it's gracious of you to say that, but I, I clearly came for the weather. And, and I, I don't mind the fog. I came from Bodega Bay in California where, in fact, we have the fog and the rain just as here. It's a privilege to be here. It's, it's uh, such a terrific opportunity to be able to marry my journalism with the academic environment and to have the opportunity to, and, and it, it sounds cliche and, and uh, coy perhaps, but it, it is so absolutely correct to have the opportunity to give back and to give back to a student body such as what we have at the School of Journalism and Communication that's at such a high level, so motivated, so both inspirational and inspired. It's, um, it, it's great to be here. Those are pretty idealis idealistic reasons for being here, and I'm actually really glad to hear it. I think I can't imagine a better form of training for our students. Does it mean you're going to be more stable, more uh, not in Call terms of... Call my wife. <laughs> yes. He's going to be more stable. <laughs> not in terms of emotional or mental stability, I see. but does this keep you fixed more than the life you've led in the past where you roamed the globe to do all kinds of different reporting? Well, that's, that's part of the beauty of, of uh, the position and the opportunity to be here at, at the university. It's, uh, there, there is some stability, which is, is not a bad thing, and I hope it has not been absent in the past in, in my life and my career, but there, there certainly is the luxury of freedom within that stability to continue to roam the world for the story, and that'll, that'll never end. Well, I'm glad to hear that. You produce at a great rate. I'm just stunned. I checked the dates on the, the publication of those books just to make sure that they really were coming out in the same year, multiple volumes in the same year. So you keep up a ferocious pace. I told you before we, we started rolling the cameras that um, this is one of the interviews on which I actually felt a little intimidated because you are teaching a journalistic interview at the moment, right? No, no question. Uh, not the intimidation. The journalistic interview class is in progress now with, with a bunch of these terrific students I'm talking about, and, and we're having a great time trying to finesse the concept that you do weekly here. 
And are you putting them um, in practical situations where they get a chance to practice the craft, or are you taking this more from a theoretical point of view? Uh, no, no, it, it's both. It's the academic and, and the practical at the same time. And in fact, the class worked together. There are 17 members in the class, and they worked together on a project that was in the Oregon Emerald, the, in the university newspaper, just last week. A big spread on the front page jumps into the inside, a very dense article that uh, tries to investigate the Oregon Student Public Interest Research Group, and they learned quickly not just about interviewing and placement, but something that you probably know well from this program, and that is blowback from the audience and those they interviewed who, as is so often the case, weren't necessarily happy with the way they were quoted. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sounds <indeed>. familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound familiar. It does happen, for sure. You are a pro at being on both sides of the table, at being the interviewer and being the interviewee. I, in preparation for talking to you today, I watched you with Bill O'Reilly, for example, and I watched you with John Stewart on The Daily Show. You went in there and you held your own. How do you prepare when you're the guest? I, I prepare, and, I, and that's one of the things that I teach in journalistic interviewing, too, is to, to prepare as the interviewer, but also think of yourself, even when you're interviewing, as an interviewee, because it is a conversation. It goes back and forth. For example, with Bill O'Reilly, knowing the history that he has, I said immediately to my publisher, I'm not doing that. And my publisher said, 40 million people or whatever the number is, watch that. You are doing that. So I, I researched uh, reports that were written by people who had been on his program and had felt that they had been mistreated. I had never much watched the program. I watched hours of it. And then I hired a colleague, a CBS News correspondent, to play Bill O'Reilly and work with me, subjecting me to that which we supposed I would be subjected to, so that when I went in, I felt I had already been around the block a few times with a Bill O'Reilly look-alike and knew something about what he was going to do, but, but I, I still was surprised. As I sat in the box, it was a live program, I sat in the box in San Francisco, he was in New York, much like this, there's a camera, and that's all, a camera operator. And in my ear, I had the program as it was going. A commercial came on, and I heard in my ear, hello, Peter, Bill here. I said, hi, Bill. He said, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to state your case, and then I'm going to make fun of you. So you can't fault him for transparency. Well, obviously, yeah. And good thing you had done that role-playing, though, because one of the things you didn't hesitate to do was talk over him the way he was trying to talk over you, right? Yes. I, I wanted to, to respect the fact that it was his program and not, not engage in a battle with him because, as you well know, when you are sitting in that anchor chair, you do have control. It's your program, and in a case such as as his program, he undoubtedly or his handlers could turn down the audio on me. I would not want to yell with him. It probably wouldn't have sold too many books either, and it might not make me look presentable. But I wanted to be able to respond to him and also create contrast. I, I consciously dressed radically different, in a radically different fashion. He has the traditional suit and tie on. I wore a sweater. I didn't shave that day. And, and I gesticulated in, I thought, contrast to his usual hand motions. All of this was, we choreographed it. It was very successful. And now that you point out to me the strategies you were using, I can see it in my mind's eye. And he set you up perfectly by saying there you were in holistic San Francisco right. or whatever his opening right. was. Yeah, yeah. Well, you really nailed that one. I thought it was terrific. Thank you for that. So you've learned to manipulate TV. You've learned to use TV to, to make TV work for you. Um, you're known as a multi-platform storyteller using a variety of different media. But it sounds as though you have a deep first love, abiding love for radio. Is that no true? No question. It is, it is our, our um, what well, is the most visual of media. This is wonderful. Television is a treat, and it's great to look into the camera and say hi to everybody, and and to and to know that the penetration that television has in our culture and it's severe, and and of course I I love books. There's this 
perhaps uh, mythical, but nonetheless a sense of, of some kind of quasi-permanence at least. But radio, nothing beats radio. Nothing beats radio to stimulate the imagination. Nothing beats radio as something to use while you're doing something else. Nothing beats radio globally in terms of reaching places where there maybe is not the literacy for the newspapers or the finances for a television set. Radio is spectacular. You have to explain just a little bit that apparent paradox when you say that radio is the most visual of media. Do you mean, in fact, that it stimulates the visual imagination? I drove down here in an unripe green tomato and it caused all kinds of attention when I parked it on a red zone and the cop tried to give me a ticket and couldn't find the windshield. And no matter how absurd that is, you get a visualization of that. And that is what is so spectacular about radio. It stimulates you to create that which is unique to you as a listener different from all the other listeners and can be, you used the word manipulated before, can be manipulated in both a positive and a negative manner by the radio producer and all you have to do is listen to the viciousness of the current popular talk radio that pervades our culture and others around the world to know how negative radio can be also. Yeah, uh, certainly. It's uh, very powerful in many different ways. You really have committed to it, though. You are the founder, you are the creator of a number of syndicated shows, for example. I wanted to ask you, are you still doing Washington Monthly on the radio? Washington Monthly on the radio is on hiatus because my partner for the program, Marcos Kunalakis, who was the publisher at Washington Monthly, is now in residence in Budapest where his wife is our ambassador, the United States ambassador. So th the program is on hiatus, but we look forward to that going back on the air when he gets back to this country. So you'll pick it up again? But we plan to. That explains why when I looked at the website it was a little unclear what was happening just at the moment. He thought that there could be perceived conflicts of interest, I think, and that's not inappropriate to think. No, and it gives you a chance to work on uh, something else in that, <laughs> in that bit of time right. for now. Yeah. There's also the Peter Lawfer Show, right? Which was on in San Francisco where I came from, from the Bay Area. And, and I think I found a home for it up here, but it's, it's premature to, to tell you yet. But I look forward to you, please, joining me as maybe my premier guest when it gets oh, on the air. That would be so fun to be on the other side of the table. Yes. I would really enjoy yes. that. And what about um, National Geographic World Talk? You were a charter anchor of that program. I, I was. We created that, tele that uh, radio program for National Geographic, which was great fun, talking with, uh, with uh, educators and explorers uh, worldwide that National Geographic sponsored, talking with people out in the middle of nowhere on cell phones. Uh, one show I in particular, I remember a, a fellow, I don't remember even what he was researching, but I remember the noise and what he described, speaking of radio, he described a herd of rhinoceros walking through a river and the fidelity was so good that we could hear them bellow or whatever it is that rhinoceros do over the satellite telephone back to the studio in San Francisco. Great fun. I love that idea because of course what everyone's first association is with National Geographic is those incredible photographs that they produce right. and the quality right. of the documentaries. So m peeling it in back into the audio and making us appreciate that component is very cool. Right, and it was fun also talking with those, those extraordinary National Geographic photographers who would talk about the, w what they were trying to achieve visually and trans transferring that or translating it to words on the radio. And, and one of the, the, the real lessons I learned from those guys was get closer. That was, the, that was uh, often the advice. What do you want to teach people about photography? Get closer. Get closer. That's yeah. a good principle in all kinds of ways for life. Perhaps, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Given that you are so attuned to sound, 
how do you feel about radio voices, about the kinds of accents we expect from our national uh, broadcasters and NPR voice? Do you have any kind of opinion oh, on that? Oh, absolutely. And, and it's so nice that, that that voice of doom, the dismal details of the Daily Downer, that that's over and that we can incorporate and appreciate different kinds of voices on the radio. And in fact, they they tend still because we're not doing because we're not doing that as much as we perhaps should they tend to really pierce through the noise those kinds of uh, those kinds of different voices and it's one of the things uh, we are we're so lucky to have uh, NPR it it does spectacular work but one of the things if i were to criticize it is the the, the homogenization of of voice and they they train for that and you can hear it if if you listen i have a friend and a colleague who operates a commercial radio station in Washington, D.C., and, and he makes fun of it with the internal promotional announcements that he airs on the radio, and they go something like, if you would like to hear a tree frog in the Amazon basin in distress, then listen to NPR. But if you'd like to know what's happening in Washington, D.C., listen to us at WTOP. And <laughs> that's great. I think that sums it up. Yeah, that's very clever. That was a great anecdote. I suppose that um, just in the interest of time, I need to shift you from radio to your written work, which is, uh, as I said, it's just so prolific. I don't know how you manage to produce at that rate. It's very impressive, and I congratulate you on a list of what's now 18 books, I think. Is that right? Are we more than that already? I, I'm not You've sure. You've lost count? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. But that sounds right, yes. <laughs> but you have also, the thing that's really extraordinary about those books is the range of material it covers. You go from neon signs in Nevada to the great huge immigration issues not only in this country but also elsewhere in the world and then recently to the reaction of soldiers coming back from Iraq. Those are all big social issues. I think it was on uh, The Daily Show you said you spent a lot of time talking or looking at nasty things in nasty places, right? Yeah, unfortunately or fortunately yeah. it, I felt it needed to be done, yeah. So how have you picked those projects over the years? What has directed you? I, I tend to, toward social issues that I think need attention. But I spend a lot of time looking at identity and migration and borders in, in a broad sense. And much of my, my work deals with that. And even when I've strayed, and this, this trilogy that I'm finishing, this natural history trilogy, is away from what I've done in the past, it, it, it really isn't. There are extraordinary border issues and, and transcultural issues. Uh, the book I wrote about butterflies that deals with the, the uh, exploitation of endangered species and cross-border uh, uh, trafficking in, in butterflies for thousands of dollars. This really is in the same neighborhood as migration from Mexico into the United States or from the former Soviet bloc into Western Europe, these aren't as divergent as, as they may appear, I don't think. Maybe I fool myself. Well, it does make sense that you're talking about the movement of commodities, whether it's human or animal or otherwise, um, across borders for sure. And I'm wondering if there's even a, um, you know, a, a link, however tangential, in, in terms of human nature and the movement of human beings and the creation of culture. You're talking about some pretty um, obsessive, twisted connoisseurship here in the, in the book about butterflies, right? Well, oh, no question. People that wish to have something that costs thousands of dollars that's illegal to hold and arguably is, is wrong to hold because it in further endangers the species and it can't be showed off publicly or acknowledged publicly because it's a prison offense. So that, I think that counts as obsessive and maybe dangerous. Absolutely, yeah. The second um, volume of the trilogy is already out, and the third one, are you still sticking with that working title, No Animals Were Harmed in the I, Writing I'm, of This I'm Book? I'm fighting with my editor on that. I hope I prevail. And, and part, of the, part of the fun of it, I, I think, if, is uh, that, of course, it's, it's not true. I'm running over something just uh, driving to the next interview, and what, what uh, animal doesn't have a home anymore because of whatever tree was cut down, even if it were in a su sustainable forest for the paper. So one of the reasons I like that title is I'm envisioning maybe some sort of epilogue that goes through all, all of these terrible things that I've done just to write this book. Not to mention what I ate along the way, maybe. 
It's certainly thought provoking. But speaking of what you eat, I read that you are a vegan. Is that correct? I I, I am a backsliding <laughs> vegan. Uh -huh. My my wife. Um, well, I think she threatens divorce if I don't eat fish. She claims it's just that she fears I'll fall over from malnutrition. Vegish is the current vogue title for those of us who are vegans and eat fish. Vegish, okay. Yes. And then it also implies a kind of a wannabe veganism. Uh, perhaps. perhaps. It does sound a little wishy-washy. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not particularly fond of it. I'm sure it's a hard one to negotiate, though. You've mentioned that it obviously causes uh, you know, some logistical issues when you're traveling or when people invite you over for dinner? Inviting me over for dinner is not, not fun. I don't recommend it. I'm socially unacceptable in that regard. It's difficult, for, for sure. Although, you know, here in Eugene, um, you're probably better off than almost anywhere else. So it's both the weather mm -hmm. and the cuisine that brought me here. That's the answer to your first question. <laughs> that, that explains it all in that case. I wanted to ask one more question about how you launched this particular series of books, this trilogy about the, the butterflies, exotic pets, and then animal rights. You, you have a, a flippant answer, which is that your experience with Mission Rejected, the book about returning uh, soldiers from Iraq, that that kind of kicked you into needing something uh, lighter, something less morally um, complex, perhaps, or difficult, or just emotionally weighty. So I believe it was again on the Daily Show. You said you you had said you, you threw out a line about writing about butterflies and flowers, and someone called you on it. Indeed, and it, and it was flippant, and it was it was at a bookstore up in Bellingham, Washington, a great bookstore, uh, Village Books, and it, it was a packed audience, a hot day. And I had one of these microphones, uh, such as uh, you've wired to me, so I couldn't take off my jacket and cool off. And I did want out off the stage. And that question came. And I did say butterflies and flowers. And, and a woman emailed me from Nicaragua and said she had recognized it was a joke, but that she and her husband lived as expats in uh, Granada. And I was welcome to come down and see their butterfly reserve and hear stories, and I would learn that there is, in fact, a book that needs to be written about butterflies. So the aforementioned wife threw me on an airplane, and uh, this, this was correct. There is an incredible, dangerous world of butterflies, and it, it all started with that throwaway remark, which goes back, I think, somewhat to your question about uh, my thematic r approach. I, I do look as the news reporter I continue to be, which is what my background is, at, at uh, b being triggered by what's going on in my environment. And that worked out so well with the Butterfly book. I'm so glad I got that email. It looks as though the progression through the trilogy is leading you more and more towards issues of conservationism, so from forbidden trade and exoticism and compulsion through to really broad issues of conservation. Is that what we can expect from the third book? I, I'm trying to, to deal with something that's probably impossible to deal with, and it's on a continuum and is differentiated by individuals. Um, I'm looking for where does animal use become animal abuse? And how do we define, how do we find and define that point, especially when there are so many different animals and so many different non, or hu so many different non-human animals and so many humans? Where is that point and what is appropriate to do with an animal? And why is it that I really don't have a whole heck of a lot of problems smashing a fly, but probably would avoid running over even a squirrel? What's that about? And even to say, even a squirrel, what's that about? That's what I'm dealing with, I think. And what about cultural specificity? This has got to be particular to particular cultures as well, right? And ab absolutely. What about the, the cricket fighting that is now uh, in vogue again in historical in China? And why is that okay and, and cockfighting is illegal in Oregon and it goes on all the time up in Lynn County, just up the street from us? What's that all about? So we've got local as well as international <laughs> issues yes, involved yes, here. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Peter, I wish we had a, an extra half hour or three hours so that we could actually talk about your um, your stance on immigration, on uh, what we ought to be doing with the Mexican border. We are, however, beginning to run out of time. So I'd like to bring this back around to the University of Oregon piece of it to some extent by asking about what you think of the present state of journalism and where its future is. You seem to have a pretty optimistic view. 
Oh, no question. We have been practicing journalism since we were drawing on the walls of caves and saying, look, I killed this buffalo, or whatever we were saying, and finding it necessary to report the news and analyze the news. And we are continuing to do that. And we're at an extraordinarily exciting time. And these students that we're working with at the School of Journalism and Communication we, we, they are going to be out in a new world in terms of how that news is reported and how they are earning their living from it. And we are privileged, privileged at the school to be working with them, figuring out along with our colleagues in industry what these new models are. This is a very exciting time and we ain't going away as journalists. So you're not taking a doom and gloom approach to this, the it's death the of print opposite. journalism? It's the opposite. And look at this. You've got notes here, paper, words on paper. No, print journalism isn't going anywhere. It's, it's just being expanded. Well, as somebody who works on 500, 600-year-old books, mm -hmm. I am sitting here firmly convinced <laughs> of the uh, utility of words on the page. But um, we've heard quite different approaches to this from other people in the industry recently. Hogwash. Okay, oh, that's a good one, okay, <laughs> hogwash. So, last words, la last words of wisdom beyond hogwash. If you, uh, if you could l cast forward into the future and think about what it is you really want to leave this generation of students with, one lesson was get close, which you assimilated from the photographers, right? Very nice right? lesson, yeah. Right. yeah. Anything else? You sure, think? get the story and, and work on clarity and accuracy and fairness. Tell a good tale. And then it really doesn't matter much if it's going to be words on paper, noise on the radio, something that we can't even imagine that's being invented right now. All of those so-called platforms need that story, and they need that story well told. And if it's going to be journalism, it has to be told with accuracy, fairness, and clarity. We do that, we're in business, and we'll figure out a way to eat. That's great, and it also gets back to the primacy of narrative for all of us who just spend our lives in association with each other, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Stories, stories, stories. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> I wish you could tell us many more, but we're out of time, so I have to thank you now for a half hour that passed extremely quickly. Thanks for your time. Oh, thank you so much for your interest. It's great to be here. We'll bring you back soon, okay? And Absolutely. you tell us about that third piece of the trilogy? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. We've been speaking with Peter Lawfer, the James Wallace Chair in Journalism at the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communication. Thank you for watching and see you next time.